Greg Fowler. I'm the Global Campus President for Southern New Hampshire University. There I handle most of the academic experiences of students across all of the various modalities that we operate in. So that includes everything from the online experience where we have about 135,000 students to the face-to-face -face residential experiences um, that we do in graduate programs as well as some of the um, hybrid programs and other um, types of credentials that we do across um, the country and around the world. When we think about the last several months of COVID and the things that are happening around the country, one of the things that we continue to say is that COVID didn't necessarily turn the organization into a different direction. And I think that's true as well for higher education in general. What I think it did was accelerate some of the things that you already saw happening throughout higher education. And that's been particularly true here in the Northeast, um, in New England, where we've seen demographic changes and changes in um, higher education experiences. Um, causing a lot of campuses to think about how do they move into the next generation of higher education experiences. So that includes certainly the work that we're doing in online, but it also requires us to rethink a lot of the things that you think about when it comes to learning experiences in general. So um, certainly the issues around a recession um, and the issues tied to that for a lot of our employees, a lot of our students, um, will mean that a lot of people will be looking for new skills and new experiences as they get to go back into the workforce. So as that begins to happen, one of the things we're going to be spending a lot of time thinking about is how do we give students that new experience, that new skill set that they're going to have or that they're going to need as they move forward? Um, and it's not going to always be the traditional types of, I've got to get a full degree or I've got to get a full uh, type of degree program, uh, credential of some sort. It's really going to be, how do I stack on to the credentials that I already have? So a lot of the work we're doing is thinking about what are those new experiences going to be like and how do we create um, the platform and the systems around which those types of things can happen. So again, it goes back to that idea of it's not so much that things are taking a left or right turn from where they were going, but certainly requiring schools that were already thinking about a lot of the things that they had to do moving forward to rethink um, how fast they're going to be moving in that direction and to be partnering in different ways than they might have been doing in the short term for a long-term evolution. Um, our freshman class coming in this year, we're actually scholarshiping all of them because we're going to be asking them to help us figure this out. So um, in the fall, we will be back um, in, in session, but we won't be on physically in the campus for the residential students. A lot of them will be participating in a different type of experience moving forward. But driving down costs is a huge part of what we're trying to do, um, trying to make sure that um, the connection between the money that you're spending and the skills that you're acquiring is clear for those students. Um, so how do we, again, partner with people who are thinking about um, helping us scale, helping us be sustainable as we're moving forward without necessarily creating huge amounts of new debt for our students as they move forward with this. So one of the big questions is, what's the new technology going to be? And also, at a time when you're dealing with huge equity issues in the country, one of the things that's been very clear from the COVID situation is that um, those inequity issues go not just to the education that students are getting, but to the society that they live in, to the communities that they're operating in, as you begin to see uh, communities of color dealing with um, COVID in a much more dramatic way than you might see otherwise. So same thing is true for education. As we're looking at technology, as we're looking at the platforms that we're dealing with, on one hand, trying to create these new models allows us to do things and reach new students. But at the same time, we're also trying to think about not putting in place these situations where the technology is so expensive that it basically puts the experience further out of reach for the very people who need it the most. So uh, these issues around diversity, equity, and inclusion are huge parts of that conversation that we're thinking even more about as we try to move forward. It is one of the big challenges, and of course, education, we honestly do believe, is the transformative um, entity within the society. It is the, probably one of the most assured ways that you're going to have to be able to change the trajectory of your destiny, the destiny of your family, the community that you live in. But at the same time, the more expensive education gets, the harder it's going to be for those who need it the most to be successful. So when we think about things like doing virtual simulations, when we think about all the things that really do help us provide a great online experience. We also have to think about how to make sure that we don't put that further out of reach. Um, that's certainly uh, becoming more and more true as we think about what the future of higher education is going to be. 
Um, right now with the COVID situation, you've had a lot of colleges that go online in very short order. Um, but, they, but I want to make sure people understand there's a difference between this sort of remote mitigation strategy that a lot of colleges are engaging in and actual online learning, which is a very deliberate process. It's, um, the example I use is it is like trying to learn to swim in the middle of a hurricane. Right now, you're just trying to stay afloat. You're just trying to make sure you can survive. But that's a different thing than trying to say you're going to be creating a learning experience that is designed for students in a way that allows you to track the data, that allows you to help them when they struggle, that allows you to figure out what the long-term solutions are going to be and to get better at that and iterate on it as you move forward. These are very different types of things than just saying we have to go remote because our students aren't going to be back after the spring break. So for a lot of campuses now in the fall as they're beginning to think about this, they're thinking differently about how to be successful at that. Um, but again, it requires you to think as well about how to work with the students who are going to struggle. And that requires you to know what causes students to struggle. Many times what causes students to struggle has nothing to do with the content. It has far more to do with life happens or the way that the campus approaches the learning experience. So we spend a lot of time trying to think about what are the things that our students are trying to tell us. Um, we talk a lot about things like user design and learner feedback and trying to make sure we incorporate those things into the things we're trying to do moving forward. So the more we're able to do those types of things and make this focused on the learner and not on the institution, the more successful they are going to be is what we believe. When people get into the online environment or when people ask us about how to move forward in this area, one of the things I say first to them is keep it simple. Um, do not try to become uh, this huge entity that Southern New Hampshire has um, managed to become over a period of time. This is not about who's the biggest, nor is it about the brightest, shiniest object. It really is about do you have a clear sense of what you're trying to accomplish and the shortest, most minimal viable product to get you there, um, and at the same time maintain the trueness to your mission that you're trying to hold on to. So um, this isn't about trying to find the biggest virtual simulation. It isn't about trying to create an experience that you can't sustain long term. Um, try to start with that question of what are we trying to solve and how do we go about approaching this in a way that helps our students be successful. Um, one of the things we saw, for example, up front when uh, a lot of students didn't come back from spring break was uh, the schools would reach out to us and say, well, I can't take the students on the study abroad trip or the field trip they were going to go on. And we began to point out to them, you know, there are entire organizations out there that can provide those types of experience in a virtual environment. You can still um, get your students to go to um, Paris, or you can still get your students to go to these places if you understand the tools that are out there, many of which are free. There's a huge movement out there between the Creative Commons work, the open educational resource work, um, tied to the type of learning objects that, and learning platforms that we're trying to work on. So um, knowing what your opportunities are is a huge part of trying to be successful in this. But it's not about trying to be the biggest, nor is it about trying to again, create these tools that you can't sustain for a long period of time. There are very, very good opportunities out there for people that are relatively low cost and simple enough to actually be approachable for both your students and your faculty. One of the things that I think people don't realize is that this isn't just about the students, though of course they're at the center of it. Trying to get your faculty up to speed if they have not been in this environment in short order is not something that's likely to help them to be successful. And if they're struggling, then your students are going to be struggling as well. So how do you create this thing that allows them to understand what they basically need to do? The goal is to start with something that you can actually maintain, that you can learn from and continue to move forward. When I was young, you had to basically have a packaged experience when it came to listening to music. It was generally a compact disc where even if you didn't necessarily need, like, or want all 15 songs, the only way to get the music was to get all of the songs and then you listen to the two or three that you wanted while the other nine or 10 you might not have ever listened to again. And you paid the $15.99, which is about what it was back then, um, for the CD um, and you basically had the whole CD. But over time, what you began to see was what we call the sort of iTunes Spotification of music. People listen to far more music now, I suspect, than they did 30 years ago in the places where they couldn't listen to music before. But they're listening to it in different ways and they're able to you know, plug and play to stack the, the types of things, things they want to listen to in different ways. So now I can create a list of music that I like for a party that I'm about to have. I can create a totally different list of music 
or um, if I'm about to go on a bike ride or, or a run, if I'm about to go on a long trip, I have this portfolio of tracks that I can plug and play as I choose to based upon what I want to do with that music. I think that learning experiences are going to do something very similar to that, um, that they will be looking more and more for, I don't necessarily need a degree, what I need is a new skill set now. What's the quickest possible way for me to get that? We are still a long way away from those days in the matrix, you know, where you can simply tell someone I want to learn how to fly a helicopter, but we are still, we are definitely further along than we might have otherwise been if we were looking at something along the lines of what we had been doing. So um, if I were saying five years from now, I do think that you will still have these sort of coming of age experiences. Absolutely so. Um, I think they will be more demanding of what they'll be looking for at the campus. But I think as well that you'll see a, a, this increasing desire by new learners or learners who are coming back to the experience um, to get new skills as they're moving forward. One of the things that you don't hear a lot about is that when we talk about the non-traditional learner as opposed to the traditional learner, um, the bottom line is that you almost have as many adult students, non-traditional learners, um, participating in higher education now as you do the 18 to 22 year old. I think that number will continue to increase because the skills that are going to be required in the future will require us to upskill ourselves um, again and again and again. Technology is not slowing down. Um, as uh, Paul LeBlanc likes to say, this is as slow as things will be for the rest of our lives. Um, so if it's going to keep um, moving at a higher rate of speed, we've got to continue thinking about how do we get those skills and continue to move forward.